Let's take our Bibles and let's uh, go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews. Now we're going to begin in chapter 12. Now this morning, if you were here in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, we saw that Paul said that that church was a, a model church. It was an example, he said, to everyone that heard about it. And a lot of people had heard about the church. A lot of people in, in Europe, because that's where it was located in what's today modern Greece, in the, in, in the European continent, had heard about the church there in, in uh, Thessalonia. And they were an example. Why well, I want to talk to you about two examples from the book of Hebrews today. One's a bad one, another one's a good one. I thought we'd start with the bad one first and end with the good one. But uh, make no mistake about it, folks. Your lifestyle is based on the decisions that you make in your life. That charts your course that you're on. You're on a course today. Life is like a journey. You're on a journey. You're on a life's journey. And that uh, the course of your life's journey is charted by the decisions, the personal decisions that you and I make. So let's look at two different people, very different people in the book of Hebrews, and I want to compare their lives. And the first one that I'd have you turn to is found in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. And I have a word of prayer, and then I'll turn your attention to this bad example. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together these minutes, and I pray that you will, even though we'll have to make it brief, Lord, that you will make this just as, as powerful as only you can do, that, again, the word would go forth, not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Lord, have your way. Get glory to the name of Jesus, through which we ask this. Amen. Well, I'll turn your attention to beginning at verse 15. Verse 15 of Hebrews 12 says this. It's actually a warning. Look diligently, lest any man or any person fail of the grace of God. Miss God's grace in their life. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat or food sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance. It was too late to change his mind about his birthright. He found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. This is Esau. He's a bad example for us. You don't want to follow Esau's example. You don't want to be anything like this man. He's an example of a person that missed the offered grace of God. Every one of us is offered God's grace, God's strength, God's ability, God's help. He missed it totally, and there were reasons why he did. And the main reason is because every single decision that Esau made was a selfish one. He made very selfish decisions, and none of the selfish decisions that he made ever ended up producing what he hoped they would. And he didn't end very well because Esau was all about himself. He's a bad example. I want to jump down to verse 17 and begin there instead of verse 15. Because I think this is the epitome of his bad example. It comes out in the fact that when it was time for him as the firstborn to receive the inheritance, and of course, that wasn't God's plan. And Jacob really hijacked the plan of God in order to make happen what God said was going to happen anyway. When it was all said and done, and when Esau found out that Jacob had stolen the blessing from him, 
we have what is said about him in that 17th verse. He sure griped. He cried. You know, murmuring in the Bible is really an attitude of self-pity. So here's the example first that is a bad example. Pitying yourself. A pity of self is what really this is all about. He's saying in his heart, if not by his words, look, I deserve better than this. I deserve to be treated better. What you think you deserve is actually different from what you actually do deserve. Let me repeat that. What you think you deserve is really different from what you actually deserve. God does not deal with us according to our iniquities. He does not give us what we really deserve. There's a gracious act that God has uh, accomplished for us so that we don't get our just desserts. And so this attitude that I deserve better is a total misnomer. It's not correct. It's a wrong way of thinking. And he, it says in that 17th verse, he sought what he wanted because he pitied himself. He sought for it with tears. He's a big crybaby. He's a crybaby because he missed out on the position of authority and the prestige that comes with that and the personal advantage it would bring to him, the material blessing that would be his. And he becomes angry over it. You see, a pity of self will breed anger in your heart. And he's angry because he didn't get what he felt he justly deserved. He felt that his rights were violated, that he was robbed by his brother. And his anger turns to what verse 15 warns us against. A pity of self becomes a poison of self. It's called bitterness in that 15th verse. Watch out. Don't miss God's grace because if you do, a root of bitterness could spring up in your heart and really crowd out everything else and not just bother you, but defile everyone that is connected to you. So there's a poison of self here because anger builds, anger seethes within, and it completely poisons the inner man, the inner person. Someone said that bitterness is like a person drinking poison and hoping that the person that offend them dies. Bitterness is really giving in to self-pity. When you don't get what you think you deserve, when you pity yourself, then you poison yourself. That's the next step. You, you poison yourself with bitterness. Look at what that leads to. In verse 16, he says, lest, watch out for bitterness, lest, there be any fornicator. Now, the word fornicator or fornication of the Bible covers all sexual immorality. Bitterness can lead to immorality because you feel like you missed what you deserved and so you, you, you feel you deserve to act out in an immoral way. In fact, Immorality, sexual immorality, is a part of self-indulgence, which is what pity of self and this poison of bitterness of self is all about. There is a pollution of self here, as I would call it, the pollution of immorality. Bitterness can lead to immorality. Bitter spouses often say, okay, I'll get even with him or her, and they enter into an affair or an immoral relationship. And then there is a, another part of this bad, there's four, four steps that I have picked out. The pity of self, the poison of self, the bitterness, the pollution of self, fornication. And then look at verse 16 again. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. The word profane there means godless or unholy 
a, a, a desecration of the individual. It actually is a word that refers to being totally secular, uh, having nothing to do with God, being completely worldly as a person. That's the profanity of self. Another part of the bad example that Esau leaves for us. He was a man that because of his bitterness and because that bitterness would lead to uh, that pollution of immorality, he didn't want anything to do with God. And I'll guarantee you that the people that don't want anything to do with God, they don't want to be in God's presence. They don't want anything to do with God because they know that he doesn't like what they're doing or what they have done. And so he was a profane person. There's the profanity of self. He wants nothing to do with God. He lives a totally secular lifestyle. He's the kind of person that selfishly does what he wants, what he feels like doing. That's the profanity of self. That's a very bad example. Well, quickly, let's turn the corner and let's look at the other side of the coin. Let's look at the positive example. Let's look at, a, look at a good example. So from chapter 12, turn back a page or so to chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to pick up with a good example. He begins uh, in verse 24 for our reference here. His name is Moses. And Moses also made four vital choices but they were choices about how he as an individual could invest his life and use all that God had given him for God. That's a good example. And so we look at Moses quickly here. And in the, the, the uh, 24th and the first part of verse 25, it says, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter when he was come to years. Uh, he wasn't a baby. He wasn't even a teenager. He was about 40 years old. When he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You know the story. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, raised him, right, as her own child. And it wasn't that he was unappreciative. It's that, look what happened. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Here's, here's a good example as far as vital choices that we make in our lives, young people, and everyone alike. And that is, choose to identify yourselves with genuine people of God, like Moses did. Be careful about the company that you hang out with, that you hook up with. Be careful about them. Make sure that you really hang with people that are genuinely the people of God. And he, Moses, chose to make the people of God his company, even though it meant persecution. See it in verse 25? He chose rather to suffer persecution with the people of God even though it brought unpleasantness and, and really painful experience in his life, he wanted to identify himself with God's people and not with others that, like Esau, were profane and polluted and poisoned. He hung out with the people of God. Another thing about him that's a good example, pick up in verse 25, the second part, he chose not only to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, a season, esteeming reproach of Christ, Messiah. Messiah. He had a, a heart that encompassed the messianic hope. Choosing rather to suffer, to esteem or value the reproach of Messiah, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And then uh, verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing God, who is invisible. Here's the second part of the good example we should take away from Moses. Not only that he 
connected with the people of God, but he was determined to be a part of the purpose of God. Verse 27, he forsook Egypt. He wanted God's purpose for his life. This is what it was all about. And he realized that choosing God's purpose in his life would, would uh, bring opposition. But here's the right viewpoint on opposition. When you do what God wants you to do, when you get in line and partner with God and his purposes, you're going to have opposition. It's not a, 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 a walk in the park. It's not a cakewalk to choose the purpose of God. But folks, we understand, and Moses un understood that opposition is really opportunity. If you look at it from God's viewpoint, it's a special tool. Opposition in our life is really, in one sense, a, a blessing from the Lord because it's a special tool that God uses in our lives. He purifies us with it. He polishes our lives through it. And he makes our lives more clearly uh, lives that reveal the power of God to others that know us. So, good example. Hang with the people of God. Choose them. And, uh, and also, in doing so, partner with God. Be a part of his purpose. And then, going back to verse 25, he chose... To, uh, not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Instead, it says in verse uh, 26, he esteemed or valued the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures Egypt could provide. And hey, he had the opportunity to really step into a place of riches as the, the prince of Egypt, I guess we could say, in a sense. But he chose, listen to me, not sinful pleasures. He chose the pleasures of God. He rejected those natural, temporal pleasures for spiritual, eternal, forevermore pleasures. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. He chose sinful lust for superior love. And I thought about that the only way to answer the command that we have, love not the world, mm -hmm. the only way to answer that command is to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, your mind, your strength, your being. That's the only way to, that's how he chose the pleasures of God over the pleasures of sin. And notice, young people, the scripture does not deny the fact that sin is pleasurable, but it's not lasting. And that's why you have to keep doing sin over and over again, because it never satisfies you. It only satisfies you temporarily and never fully. And so you have to repeat it. That's what addiction's about. It's people that are satisfying themselves over and over again with the pleasures of sin whatever the addiction might be. Good example, the pleasures of God over the pleasures of sin. And the fourth and final thing in verse 26 that I wanted to bring out is that he esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches of the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, the, the payback that God would give one day. That's, I would say, he was looking to the provision of God instead of the provision that this world would offer him. He calculated profit in light of eternity, heavenly values. <laughs> you ever see the, or hear the saying, you know, a, a bad day of fishing is better than any good day at work? <laughs> you ever hear that one? Yes. It's a saying for lazy people, okay? <laughs> Simple as that. But the real fact of the matter is, and I could put it this way, the, the worst day as a believer on this earth is a million times better than the best day of a person that's lost forever. No comparison. Romans 8 
you have trials that are for a moment. Or 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. They're for a moment. But then you have eternal reward. And this is what he chose. An enduring reward versus a temporary fix that will perish. So I think we all need to ask ourselves, you need to ask yourself this afternoon, which of these two examples do you most closely identify with? The bad example of Esau or the good example of Moses? Let me close with this poem. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth or falsehood for the good or evil side. But to every man there openeth a way and ways and a way. And some men climb the highway and some men grope below. And in between on the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. And to every man there openeth a highway and a low. And every man decideth which way his soul shall go. All of our decisions are setting us up for the course that our life is taking. Are you living for yourself or are you living for the Lord? Are you living for time alone or are you living for eternity? Are you living for what you can get out of life now or are you living for the Lord that one day your life will be enriched with heavenly reward? forever. And it doesn't matter what your job is, whether you slave in a as a housewife or, you know, whether you have a job outside of the home or whether you're a student, whatever it is, your decisions are charting the course that your life is taking. Does God have a say in it? And whose example do you most closely identify with?